Welcome. My name is E. Rich Reed, and I'm the director of the Southwest Harbor Public Library. And I'm so glad you could join us. All of you are online and surely know by now today is Giving Tuesday. And we offered a link in the chat in case you'd like to make a donation to help support our library programs. This Saturday brings our holiday book sale starting at 9 a.m. with two raffles, one for the ever coveted gallon of Holly Masterson's caught scallops and also a Judy Taylor art print of Echo Lake. Our following Tuesdays will, will bring talks from our town selectman, Carolyn Ball, on how local government works, and then also the following Tuesday by Sarah Curran on the State of Maine's Climate Action Plan. We're recording this event, and it'll be available on the library's YouTube channel within a few days. Judy's talk will take near a half hour, and we'll have a question and answer period afterwards. Please keep your microphones muted unless you're answering, asking a question. And then also know that we'll keep everyone's cameras off during the presentation just to help overall video quality. And then, you know, we will um, allow videos um, during the question and answer period. We have signed copies of Discovering Tunisian Cuisine for sale at the, in the library. And if you'd like it shipped, please purchase a copy directly from the author online. A link is available in the chat. Judy Hallett is an award-winning documentary filmmaker and has been making films for nearly 50 years. She's worked with the National Geographic Television as her senior producer for Explorer. And in 1991, she formed her own independent company, Judith Dwan Hallett Productions. She's produced over 100 documentaries on diverse subjects. Judy has also just completed her memoir, From Groucho to Gauchos, Adventures of a Documentary Filmmaker on her life as a documentary filmmaker. And the library has a copy on order right now. Please warmly welcome Judy Dwan Hallett. Okay, thank you, Judy. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining. I'm so honored that you wanted to come in on this Zoom. And thank you, Erich, and thank, thank you, Kate, for arranging all of this. Um, generally, what I do when I talk about my cookbook is just talk about the cookbook. But tonight, I'm going to talk also about why, as a documentary filmmaker, I made this cookbook and what are some of the same skills you use to make a film as well as to um, write a cookbook. So here we go. This is the cover of my cookbook. But first I thought for those of you who don't know where Tunisia is, I would explain that it's on the Mediterranean. It is in North Africa. To the west is Morocco, Algeria, then comes Tunisia and Libya. And as you can see, it is only 90 miles away from Sicily, part of Italy. So it really is location, 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 a crossroads of many, many civilizations that go back thousands of years. Um, the first people, probably the indigenous people were the Berbers, or as they like to be called now, the Amazed people, and they go back over 7,000 years ago. Then came the Phoenicians, and then the Romans, and then the Arabs, the Ottomans, and finally the French. Um, many of you might not know that Carthage is in Tunisia, and Carthage was founded by the Phoenicians in 1100 BC, and it was founded by a queen, Queen Alicia or Dido. Um, after well, the Phoenicians were there for quite a while and there, the Greeks came and went, and eventually the Romans came and there were three Punic Wars. Finally, in 146 BC, the Romans absolutely destroyed Carthage and it became the Roman Empire. After the Roman Empire, well, there were, the Vandals came in, the Romans held on a little bit, the Byzantines were there for a while, and then the Arabs came 
and in the seventh century, and it, they crossed the deserts all the way to Spain. And uh, as you can see on this map, it was, they conquered a huge amount of territory, starting way up in Samarkand, Afghanistan, all the way to Spain. So um, this Tunisia was right there in the crossroads of that. One of the great mosques that was built in 670 AD is Karawan that is still there today if you ever visit Tunisia. It's an absolutely beautiful mosque. Um, when the Arabs came, they pushed the Berbers up into the mountains. So the Arabs couldn't attack them. And they went into their caves. They dug into the mountainside of the caves. And um, the Arabs then built cities. And here is Tunis, like it is today. This is in the Medina. And then in the 1600s, Tunisia was occupied by the Ottomans, the Turks. And so now you have the Ottoman influence. Probably with the Ottomans, they introduced baklava, as well as probably couscous. Um, and then in 1881, the French invaded Tunisia and Tunisia became a French protectorate for nearly a hundred years. So you have the huge French influence and of course the French food influence as well. Italy was around too. So you got an Italian cuisine as well as a, Tunis a French cuisine. And finally in 1956, under President Habib Bourguiba, Tunisia became independent. And then only eight years later, my story begins because I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Tunisia in 1964 to 66. I taught English as a second language at L'Ecole Bourguiba. I really wanted to make films. They said there was going to be a television station there, but there wasn't any, and so I taught English. But this is where I met my husband, Stanley, who was also a Peace Corps volunteer, and he was an architect. And we together made our first documentary films on the Berbers of Southern Tunisia that were up in those caves up in the mountains, although a lot had come back down. Um, there is Stanley on the right of your screen with the camera in the wheelbarrow, and I'm in the middle with the very primitive tripod. And that's me on the left too. We, um, this film that I was able to complete actually got me into, was one of the reasons I got into UCLA film school in California. There were a hundred graduate students and I was one of three women, which is totally amazing. That has now changed. There are a lot more women filmmakers, but when I started, there were very few. Now we jump 50 years later, when Stanley and I have been married now for over, I think it's something like 56 years. And uh, Stanley was invited back to Tunisia to help set up and lead a month long workshop for architecture students at the University Tunis Carthage. And I went along. So the president of the university put us up in this beautiful boutique hotel. And he insisted that his cook make meals for us every night. And this is Hasna there preparing. Here is a, those are brikalov, which is a Tunisian uh, dish. And these are some of the uh, professors that Stanley brought in for the workshop. At the end of the table is the president and next to him is his wife. And there is Stanley uh, in the black shirt. And I, uh, was so, I just thought the food was so, so delicious and I wanted to learn how to do it. So I went to all the libraries, I went to the bookstores, I looked online and I couldn't believe it, but there were very, very few Tunisian cookbooks in English. And the ones that were there were awful. And the same thing with French. Uh, so I complained at the dinner table one night and the president said, well, why don't you and my wife, Rauda, here do a cookbook? So we naively said, well, why not? And it did take us three years, but we did it. 
And I have to say that I did have a background because my mother, Lois Dwan, was the restaurant critic for the LA Times for over 18 years in the 60s and the 70s. And so I was surrounded by food all my life. And my mother was a great cook. My grandmother was a great cook. And um, I just all, have always appreciated good food. Now, also equally important, my father, Robert Dwan, was a director of the Groucho Marx show, You Bet Your Life. So in some ways, I am a product of both a marriage between filmmaking and cooking. And uh, this brings us right up to date. I have just finished another book from Groucho to Gauchos, The Adventures of a Documentary Filmmaker. But that's another story. Tonight's story is how does a filmmaker become a cookbook writer? Well, first of all, I have to say that I have always been interested in cultures and understanding uh, I believe that by looking at other cultures, you can understand them better and it brings the world a little bit closer together. I'm a great believer in figuring out ways to have a peaceful world and not a world of war. So we, one of our very early films that Stanley and I did together was in Afghanistan on the nomads of Badakhshan. And then I, we were in Salt Lake City, that's where Stanley was teaching, and I got a job at the television station, the NBC affiliate in Salt Lake called KUTV, and I was a producer reporter, and that's really where I got my legs and I learned all about filmmaking. Um, and even there, I was interested in, in sort of... Uh, culture like cowboys, I love cowboys. And so I did a film on the buckaroos of Utah, Idaho and Oregon. Um, after um, KUTV, 15 years later, we moved to Washington DC and I was lucky enough to land a job at National Geographic Television as a senior producer. And one of the films I made was on Jane Goodall and her chimpanzees in Tanzania. So I'm always interested in going to other countries and understanding um, their, their ways of life, even chimpanzees. <laughs> and then five years later, I formed my own company, Judith Juan Hallett Productions. And I, again, made films all over the world from Egypt to Brazil to Poland, where I did a film on John Paul II. Uh, and then even to Indonesia, to Papua, Indonesia, which is the Indonesian side of New Guinea, where I did a film on the Korowai who lived in tree houses 40 feet above the ground. And they practiced a form of ritual cannibalism based on their criminal justice system. And here again is where I try to make something that seems incomprehensible comprehensible. And so that if you understand the reasons like why these people practice cannibalism, uh, it, you, you get it, you really get it. And, and the, with them, it had to do with their whole criminal justice system, but also they have very little meat there. They really mainly eat uh, roots and um, birds and, and a few bugs and things. So uh, and then I also have gone to Yemen in the empty quarter and worked with women in Yemen. So my background has been very varied, but I'm visiting a lot of different cultures. And that's why when they, the president of the university suggested we do a, a cookbook on Tunisia, it was really right down my alley. And so you might wonder what are the skills that a filmmaker has uh, that could help you do a film, a book on cooking? Well, research, then observation in the kitchen, and then documenting that. I documented it first with a little camera. And then uh, of course, interested in the culture and the reasons why these recipes are. It turns out that Rauda and Hasna, these were their favorite recipes from their grandmothers, 
from their mother-in-laws. And, um, and so the, the traditional Tunisian cuisine passed down from generation to generation. Obviously taking notes, I was in the kitchen taking notes all the time, finding the story about that would be which recipes are good uh, and would work in an American cuisine, of course setting up the shoot and then pho photography, making it as visually interesting as possible and then finding good characters in a film. Well, in a cookbook it's figuring out what are the best recipes, the food. So here we are in the kitchen, that's Hasna and Arauda, and they're making, here is a couscous. And one of the things that um, was a little bit difficult was that Hasna only spoke Arabic. And so when I'd ask, well, you know, what, do you, what are the ingredients and how much? She would answer in Arabic, then Rauda would, tell me in French, and then I'd write it down in English. So some of it was lost in translation. It was one of the reasons I had to do a lot of testing back in the United States. Um, here, Rada is doing, this is another couscous. This is a chicken. No, I think that's a fish couscous. But the other thing was, how do I say how much? You know, uh, she would only say like a pinch of salt or she just didn't measure. So my friend, Joan Nathan, who is a celebrated Jewish cookbook writer said, bring along some measuring spoons and a measuring cup. And so I'd hold up my measuring cup and say, okay, Hasna, how much of this do you put in there? And she'd point or with my measuring spoons. And that's how I got the measurements because Americans like to be quite precise. And so when I went back to America and we did this, I did this three times, uh, I tested all the recipes in my kitchen right here. And also when I would go up to Maine every summer. And I also had 20 friends and family test the recipes and give me feedback. So I was constantly adjusting um, the recipe so that they would work in America. And everything in the cookbook, all the ingredients you can find here, that is not a problem. Now, here it is, voila, the cookbook. Um, and as you can see, I wanted to make it as visually uh, pleasing as possible. And I did the table of contents in the way that a Tunisian would uh, serve a big dinner or a meal. It would always start with soups and then salads and then their traditional brick, which I'll explain later. <clears throat> tagines, which is not like a Moroccan tagine. A, a Tunisian tagine is like a frittata. And um, I, it's absolutely delicious and one of my favorite things to make. Um, and then of course, couscous, and then it goes on to stews and desserts. Now in Tunisia, the tile work is absolutely extraordinary. So I wanted to incorporate pictures of the tile work in the book. I also, all the plates and everything and the tapestries are all Tunisian to give you a feel of the Tunisian culture, its crafts and the architecture. Then I did an introduction explaining why I would make a cookbook on Tunisia and Mainly, this is a gift back to Tunisia because of the two years in the Peace Corps. These were enriching, incredible two years of my life. It changed my life. And of course, that's where I met Stanley. So Tunisia is a romantic place for me. Plus, it's a very beautiful country. And nobody knows about Tunisian cuisine. They know about Moroccan cuisine. You know about Greek cuisine, you know, Italian. French, of course, but Tunisia, no. And it is an extremely healthy uh, Mediterranean cuisine. So then I have Rauda who tells her story and she wants to emphasize the fact that it's a healthy Mediterranean diet. And it's mainly based on fresh fruits, vegetables, and plenty of fish. Now, those of you who are vegetarians, all the recipes in this book can be done without meat. They don't, their meat is mainly lamb, but mainly it's the fresh ingredients. 
And uh, Rauta, of course, is also very proud of her olive oil because Tunisian olive oil, according, according to Tunisians, is the best in the world. The vegetable markets are incredible and they display them in a beautiful way. And uh, everything, of course, is fresh there. You don't really have much canned stuff, some. Soups, this is one of my favorite soups. It's just a vegetable soup. And the hard part about it is just all the chopping you have to do. What is interesting about Tunisian cuisine is they don't even use a broth. So it's all just fresh ingredients and the vegetables make their own, its own broth. So it's very delicious. And uh, as you can see, it's just potatoes and carrots and whatever you wanna throw into the soup. Lovely, lovely taste. Uh, carrots, well, carrots are one of my favorite things. So I had to have a carrot. This is a carrot salad, so easy to make. One of the things in this cookbook is I tried to pick recipes that are easy to do. This, all you do is steam the carrots, then chop them up, and then you can let it cool and you put a little olive oil in there and, um, and some coriander. Tunisians use coriander, turmeric, cumin a lot and uh, serve it. Uh, salad uh, mashuia is a grilled vegetable salad. And the hard part about this is that you, and it's not that hard, you have to char the peppers and the tomatoes so that the skin comes off. Then you blacken them, usually put it under the broiler or you can fry it too, or um, barbecue, get it off with the coals, but that's what, how the Tunisians do it. But then you have to let it cool and then you peel off the skin so that the interior is extremely tender. And they all, Tunisians love tuna fish. And they make, they can their own tuna fish and they think it's the best in the world because they also use their Tunisian olive oil uh, in their canned tuna fish. Uh, this is a, a, a Tunisian salad. It's called Slata Tunsa. And that's practically on every menu in, uh, in a restaurant in Tunisia and at home. It's made with um, tomatoes and cucumbers and olives, and of course, tuna fish. And uh, what else is in there? Uh, peppers and scallions, did I say that? And uh, uh, also extremely easy to make. It's just the chopping that takes a little bit of time, but um, really good. Artichokes. Now artichokes are everywhere. And so they're very inexpensive. And it's sort of funny, when I was a Peace Corps volunteer, uh, a lot of the vendors in the morning would go down with their carts selling the tomatoes and their artichokes. And when the artichoke man came by, he'd shout out the word for artichoke. Well, you won't believe it, but in Arabic, the word for artichoke is ganaria. So I learned that word. <laughs> um, this is artichoke hearts, very easy. I mean, in Tunisia, since they're so uh, they're everywhere uh, and it's cheap. They just use the artichoke hearts and you just take the char artichoke hearts and then marinate it with uh, olive oil and lemon juice. And uh, uh, easy, another easy, easy salad to make. Uh, Bricoleuf. Now Bricoleuf, this is a, a very traditional Tunisian um, appetizer. And as you can see from the little pictures here, um, it is made with a dough that is called malsuka. This is a thin pastry dough similar to phyllo. And it's generally served as an appetizer or first course. For the most part, Tunisians buy the masuka, but some traditionalists even make that dough. And during the month of Ramadan, the Muslim month of fast, Bricks are served practically every evening during iftar, the evening meal that breaks the day long fast. Um, so to make this, as you can see, you put it in a little square and then the stuffing, I call it, which is just a little bit of parsley and potatoes and scallions and capers and a little bit of, uh, of uh, tuna fish. 
and you make it like a moon crescent, drop an egg, fold it, and then drop it into the um, boiling oil, cook it about two minutes on each side and take it out and you eat it immediately. And it is absolutely delicious. Now, some people wonder where the uh, brick comes from. Well, a lot of people think it's the Berbers because you find a variation of the Brikaluf in Algeria and in Morocco. So it probably came all the way back. The Berbers were making this, but it might also have come from the Ottomans because uh, Borak means to fold and that's very close to brick. And maybe uh, it because you fold it, uh, it might have come from there. That is a, it's a possibility because the Ottomans were there for such a long time. Or one of the other uh, suggestions is it's really from the Jews from the island of Jerba. The Jews from the island of Jerba have been there since the sixth century BC and they're still there today. And it's very possible that they're the ones who actually, uh, I don't know if you want to call it, invented it, but were the ones that maybe introduced the brick to Tunisians. Now, as I was saying, olives and olive oil is really important. And olive oil is one of the major exports to Tunisia. So this is a, a, an olive grove in Sfax and the women uh, gathering. And then their couscous is the other major, major dish in Tunisia. And this is the traditional way of uh, separating the grain with the uh, with these sifters. Uh, now, couscous, rout is very, very, very favorite uh, dish of couscous is with fish because she's from the island of Jerba. So this is a, a fish couscous. Couscous really, it does take a little bit of time and you can do it traditionally with a couscousier, which is a special pot, or you can actually, you know, you can get the packaged couscous. Uh, Tunisians frown on that, but you can you can simplify it a little bit. Uh, fish uh, is everywhere, and the fish markets are beautifully displayed, as you can see here. Gorgeous photos in themselves. And uh, my favorite fish is a dorad, which is uh, like a sea bream. And um, you just grill it on the grill. And it's just made with a little bit of um, cumin, salt and pepper and olive oil. And you grill it and it is fantastic. And then serve it with um, lemons. You can also do branzino or a red snapper. We've tried all of them. Uh, meat, as I was saying, uh, is lamb, mainly lamb. And the, you have just go to one butcher shop for the meat. Uh, and here are lamb chops. Rada likes to put some rosemary underneath or and other herbs underneath the lamb chops so that the, the scent and goes through the lamb chops, the flavor, and uh, it's really delicious. Easy, of course. Marka is a stew, but it's not like an American stew that's mostly meat. It's mostly the vegetables. In fact, you don't even need to use the meat you can skip the lamb, you can use lamb or you can use chicken and you bake it. And it's easy, it's another one of my favorite recipes because it's so easy to do and absolutely delicious. Now there is a thing called matfuna, which is an oxtail stew with Swiss chard, which is a Jewish dish. And the reason is that the Jews on, on uh, Saturday couldn't cook. So this is a slow cooking, takes six hours, four to six hours to make. And um, our friend who was a celebrated chef in America, Monsef Medeb, suggested we add this to the cookbook. And what he said, I'm gonna read, uh, he insisted we include it in our cookbook. According to Monsef, it's one of the grand dishes of Tunisian cuisine, although, he describes it as looking like the debris dredged up from the bottom of a pond, dark and muddy. Uh, but this stew is well worth the effort. It is the hardest dish in the, in the cookbook, but it is absolutely delicious, very tender. And then there, 
fruit is very important. And um, uh, this is a fruit stand. And then the uh, one of the wild fruits is uh, uh, called prickly pears. It's off of the cactus. And this is when we were on our way to Duga, which is another beautiful uh, Roman town. And uh, so for desserts, you mainly have fruit and dates, and dates are also grown in Tunisia. And uh, with the with the fruit, you have always at the end of the meal mint tea and pastries. And generally, the pastries you buy at a pastry shop. And if you really want to be special, you put pine nuts uh, in the mint tea. And as you can see, Rada pours her tea high up. So it aerates the tea and is more delicious. Um, spices, very important. Their, their favorite spices are turmeric, cumin, and coriander, and of course, the, the salt and pepper and the others. I will read you about turmeric because this has become an in, in herb in the United States. Turmeric has an earthly, slightly peppery mustard-like flavor. In India and Southeast Asia, this plant has been used for thousands of years as both a dye and as a medicine. Recent laboratory and animal research studies show that turmeric has an array of potentially beneficial properties from treating or preventing arthritis, inflammation, indigestion, colitis, and to treating cancer, cardiovascular disease, dementia, depression, diabetes, skin diseases, and ulcer. It's clear why so many people are calling turmeric the miracle spice. Now, I don't know if they really does cure all those things, but people think so. And then cumin too is another uh, spice that is used a lot in Tunisia. And this too, many people claim it's especially good when you have indigestion or a stomach ache. So, here we are, the Americans have just discovered turmeric and cumin, but the Tunisians have been using it for thousands of years. And that is the end of my cookbook. And if you want to learn more, go to Judy and Stanley Hallett Productions.com. And uh, you can also, there you will see our website and you will see uh, that I've also done four short videos. And one is on, um, the tagine and one is on the brick and one is on salads and so forth. So to see the four videos of Judy in the kitchen, you can go to my website. And now I am going to show you just a short clip. And today we're going to make Marka Zara Ficucha. It's really beautiful. This is the juice. Okay. And one final thing, which is a Judy touch. I always have to put a little bit of decoration. Parsley, and since we have that beautiful rosemary, I'm going to just do that, and it's ready to serve. And, et voila, our Tunisian potato and lamb stew. Bring in the bricks. So here are the bricks, done. And in Tunisia, during Ramadan, this they have every day at the end of the day to break the fast. Now you might wonder, how do you eat a brick? Well, you grab the two corners of the triangle and then you're going to eat it in the middle. That is one way, because the idea is you do not want the egg yolk to drip onto the plate. Today, we're going to do a taji a spinach tagine with lamb. And we have a special guest 
a vrai Tunisian, a real Tunisian who's living now in America. So come on in, Pella. She's going to make sure I do this correctly. <laughs> I'm sure you will do it beautifully. beautifully. <laughs> well, it's ready. We're, We're going to pull it out. Uh, oh my goodness. Beautiful. But I add a little bit of parsley just to make it really pretty. Oh, beautiful. So, we oh, did it! Yes, Yay! <laughs> Thanks for your help. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you for yeah. having me. Uh, so now we're going to go to the table and taste it. Here we are. And I think we need to invite the rest of the crew. Stop show. So there you have it. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? And yeah, like Kate is allowing um, you know people to get their cameras working again. So okay, so we have Carolyn on Dang has a question. Um, I can't seem to uh, open up my videos. <laughs> can't get her. Okay. Yeah, let's see. I can see her. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah, Carolyn, why don't you just ask your question and we'll wrestle with the video on our end as well. Okay. Um. Hi, my name is On. Um, I'm zooming in from Utah currently. Uh, Mrs. Hallett, hi, a pleasure as always. Hi, <laughs> um, Zach. <laughs> congratulations on such a meaningful and compelling project. Um, I can't wait to order it. <laughs> um, so I'm sure through your interactions, um, with the people of Tunisia and your experiences of the culinary culture and its roles in that region, um, these recipes must have a personal significance to you, um, meaning there must be uh, a distinctly human component to each of the meals. Um, so could you please speak on uh, which recipes hold particular meaning to you and why? Well, first of all, what was interesting to me was being in the kitchen with Rauda and Hasna, the three of us, we really bonded. And these were their mothers and mother-in-laws and grandmothers' favorite recipes. And some of them I had never had before because they're really not uh, all served in restaurants. For instance, the tagine. I had never had the tagine before in a restaurant. And so, and they were very proud of, of those tagines. And there's so many different ways to do it. You can do it vegetarian or, you know, or with spinach and cheese. And um, just the, the pride that these two women had in preparing these dishes, the tagine. And then also, they're just so proud of the seasonal fruits and vegetables. And so the salads, I know this sounds a little silly, but there were so many different salads. And that's why I have so many salads in the cookbook is because depending on the season, there's a different kind of salad and they're not difficult to make and they're just so healthy. And again, it was these women's pride and that Tunisian cooking is so fresh and good for you. Um, they also have this, um, I didn't realize how much of the heritage of the passing down of these different civilizations um, and how proud they were that, that all these different civilizations influenced them. And so it influenced me a little bit too. Great, thank you. Um, we also have a comment. Um, within the chat from um, Jeffrey, who says, Ramada is a big holiday um, when the most important meals are served. And what might the dishes um, be past the appetizers? How is the food made and by who? 
and what other big holidays might call for special meals? Well, all the big uh, um, Muslim holidays, they have special meals. And uh, the Tunisians really rally around these, these different holidays. As for what they eat, well, it's huge because they, for Ramadan, you fasted all day long. So you start out with a brick of but then you go to a soup and then you go to a salad and then you have the couscous. And then you have, usually they sometimes even have a sweet couscous at the end. You have the pastries and you have the tea and some, and lots of times, actually nowadays they even have ice cream. They seem to like ice cream a lot too. So um, the, for these big holiday um, meals, they're enormous. And one of the nice things about it is Tunisia is still a very family culture. And so all the family gets together and they're large, it's extended, expanded family. So it's just not, you know, mom and pop, it's mom and pop and auntie and grandma and grandpa and, you know, uh, so they're, they're big feasts. They're, they're big. <laughs> Thank you. And okay, we have um, Rob Duan, has you have your hand up? Hi there, uh, can you see me? I, I'm not sure I turned the camera on with them. Yes, I uh, can see you. This is my brother. <laughs> We're hello, a big family. <laughs> hello, dear sister. It's a bit of a family reunion. I see our cousin Nancy uh, it, uh, has uh, joined us. Um, I have a couple of questions. One, um, for those of us who don't want to spend a lot of time shopping, what is your recommendation for a beginning recipe? Uh, and the second, it sounds like uh, Tunisia is one of your favorite places that you've visited. I wonder, other than Tunisia, what would be your second favorite place? <laughs> well, as for a beginner in shopping, um, you know, the easiest recipes are the salads, of course. And then actually the tagine, because it's really just um, eggs. You use eight eggs to make that tagine and then spinach and if you want a little bit of lamb it's not difficult and the stews the markas are very easy they're not difficult and you just you know put everything in a in a pot and put that in the oven yes tunisia is one of my favorite places i mean i didn't even talk about the beaches they're gorgeous and then all i didn't really talk about all the roman architecture there's an incredible Colosseum, El Gem, that's even better preserved than the uh, Roman Colosseum in Rome. And they're all of these wonderful, uh, and nobody knows about them, Roman cities that they uh, are still, you know, pretty intact for being, <laughs> going back to 100 BC or whatever. So um, it, it is, it, I highly recommend it as a place to visit. It's really, they're very tourist friendly and actually they need a lot of visitors now. And they've gone through kind of a hard time at the moment. Um, as for my second favorite country, <laughs> it's probably France. Thank and you. then Italy. <laughs> And we have a hand up from Busy Graham. Ah, Busy, hi. <laughs> hey, Judy, that was such a fabulous presentation. My goodness, and, and so many rich memories from, from our time in Tunisia. Um, and, and definitely, I have to go back to that cookbook and explore some more. Just, I mean, visually, that, that cookbook is, is just incredible. And, and the contents obviously are scrumptious. Uh, I also just wanted to take the opportunity to introduce you to Behan Kagri Trak, who's, who's um, on the Zoom. And she uh, published a, a, an, another truly amazing cookbook um, of Turkish cooking. Uh, it's called The Ottoman Turk and the Pretty Jewish Girl. Girl. And um, so my dream is to have both of you do a, um, alive and then seeing how incredibly 
uh, effective and, and wonderful it is on Zoom. Do it, do it live and on Zoom. But to have you, have you both um, do a, a book signing together. Um, Thank you. Thank as, you. As many places as we can bring you. <laughs> ah, wonderful. Well, I must say that Busy's father, Dick Graham, was the director of the Peace Corps when we were there. And he's responsible for me getting there because he believed in me. And at one point in training, they were thinking that I was a little bit too independent. <laughs> and he stood up for me and said, no, we need her. And so it, if it weren't for Busy's father, I would never have gone to Tunisia and never have met Stanley <laughs> and never have met Busy. We like taking responsibility for that. Yes. <laughs> A great, a great coup right there. Um, yeah, I wish my dad could be here to, to see that cookbook and see this presentation. Yeah. And I can't wait to read your memoir. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Gaucho to gauchos. Uh, that is fantastic. Uh, yeah, that, that will be some wonderful reading. And, and Judy, what? can you say a word or two about your, the, the, your gauchos book? Well, it just came out. And so it, what I have right now is a limited edition, if anyone is interested. It is, I have to say, a beautiful book. It's, it's, quite, it's almost like a coffee table book because I have over almost 100 photos in there too. Because as I said, I really like to present visually the culture. And since I've been to so many different cultures around the world, uh, the book is really not only to talk about behind the scenes of how you make a film in another country, but it's also uh, to introduce you to these different cultures, be it Afghanistan or Yemen or Indonesia or even America. And, um, uh, and then just the trials and tribulations of all the things that happen when you make a film. Thank you. All right, so um, so it looks like we're winding down. I want to make a, a big pitch for on page 65, the tagine with the parsley, sweet pea, potato, ricotta, and feta. That is definitely a winner. I can I can speak personally too. So oh, definitely great. recommend that. So thank you. And yeah, and thank you so much for joining us on this event. This has been this has brought great warmth to us here in Southwest Harbor, Maine. My my husband Stanley is coming up. He has a question. Great. Oh. And what isn't part of the work being donated? Oh, yeah. Uh, if you could tell them how to order the book, and also I wanted yeah. to emphasize that if you order it, I'm giving twenty percent uh, to the library. Great. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so you can. Um, so within the chat, we have a, a link to. Um, Judy's website. And then also any of you that want to pick up a copy here, we have we have books at the library and you can contact us directly, you know, whether you walk in or or whether you um, you know give us a call or email. So so the yeah, the books books are waiting. And yeah, and again, I've we've got the we've ordered um, Judy's new book. And for any library borrower, I will return this book. And so somebody can borrow this if they're ready, um, tomorrow as well. So, yeah. So, yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you, Kate Pickup McMullen, for all your support for this event. And, and Stanley for all your heavy lifting as well. So, yes, I have to say thank you to my technical support over here. I have my husband, Stanley, and my son, Jung Su. I couldn't have done it without them. And thank <laughs> you. Uh, library for doing this. I'm really honored. All right, thank you.